breast cancer and I have a family. I have breast cancer and I have a job. I have breast cancer and I have plans. I'm in treatment. I'm triple negative. I'm metastatic. I'm BRCA positive. I'm new to this. I have breast cancer and I needed someone to talk to. I needed information. I needed help with my bills. I needed to know what chemo would be like. I needed to know I could do this. Living Beyond Breast Cancer is a national cancer organization created by and for women with breast cancer and those who love them. We provide support and advice, organize programs and activities to raise awareness and hope. I have breast cancer and I have support. I have information. I have advice. I have breast cancer and I have hope. I have living beyond breast cancer. So welcome to Living Beyond Breast Cancer's annual conference on metastatic breast cancer. I'm Jean Sachs, I'm the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and I'm really pleased to welcome you all in the room today, as well as to welcome all of those that are watching us via live stream. It's exciting to have an opportunity to reach so many people. Um, just to remind everyone, Living Beyond Breast Cancer's mission is to connect people impacted by breast cancer with trusted information and a community of support. And our vision is a world where no one impacted by breast cancer feels alone or uninformed. Today is an example of putting our mission into action. There will be a lot of things that you learn today. We've brought in some amazing doctors, scientists, and healthcare professionals from around the country. And you'll be able to get your questions answered, learn new information. But I think one of the most important things you will get is that you will learn from each other and hopefully make some new friends. I know some of you probably know each other from online communities, um, but here's like, oh my God, we actually get to see each other in person, not just in the virtual world. And we really do believe at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, there's a lot of power to that. Um, so get phone numbers, you know, find ways to connect. And, um, and, and stay in touch, because that's really what we want to be able to do. Um, we at Living Beyond Breast Cancer know that metastatic breast cancer can be very, very isolating. And now that treatments are becoming so much more personalized, it can be even more isolating. So that's why we, today's program is really designed to give information that is going to be meaningful to you and to your specific diagnosis. And we're not new to this. <laughs> Living Beyond Breast Cancer has actually been holding this conference for 12 years. Um, we have been. And we have known, in 2006, we did our first needs assessment of those living with metastatic breast cancer and published a paper called Silent Voices. And that was at a time where very few breast cancer organizations were dealing with the issues that the metastatic community faces. Fortunately, things have really, really changed, and there's a lot of advocacy organizations that are out there and doing things, and we're really happy to be part of them. Um, we're doing a lot this weekend, as we always do. So not only is the conference going on, we've trained our next class of Hear My Voice volunteers yesterday. Um, where, are, where, are, where is the new class? All right. So for those of you that don't know what Hear My Voice is, this is a program we started in 2015 to bring um, the people living with metastatic breast cancer together to become advocates. Um, this is our fourth training, fifth, tra fifth training. Um, so we have, we're building this big group of people from around the country. So if you're interested in learning more, go to the LBBC table. We will be doing another training next year. Um, I'd like to start because I think this also really helps our speakers. Is let's let's think about who's in. Let's find out who's in the room today. Um, so can we start by asking all the caregivers to Sam, the people that are here because someone they love has breast cancer. You guys are really important. 
um, you just can't do this alone. So thank you for taking time on your Saturday for being here. Um, so let's next move to if the people can stand who have been diagnosed in the last year, that this is new for you. This is, this is new. And how about those of you where it's been two to three years that you've been living with metastatic breast cancer? Because we want to see you. And how about four to six? All right. And how about over seven? I know you're here. So I hope for those of you that stood up first, that you're in your first year, this is empowering to you and this is inspiring. So know that there's a lot of people doing really well. So thank you for, for being willing to stand up. There's over 500 people here today and you represent 39 states, Washington DC and three Canadian provinces. And I think that nearly 373 of you have never attended this conference before. And, and that's so important. We always want to get new people here. So thank you for, for, for being here. Um, about 114 of you are here because you received a travel grant um, that paid for your travel. And 13 of those were caregivers who retreat, received travel grants. You can clap. And we know at Living Beyond Breast Cancer that cancer is expensive. Um, and yeah, cancer is expensive. And often you can't find the, the funds to come to Philadelphia for a weekend and pay for a hotel and, and pay the registration fees. So we are very fortunate that we have sponsors that underwrite the cost to make this happen. And I want to talk about one organization that joined us last year, Forward for Toby. Um, they came here last year and helped underwrite some of our travel grants and then they called me back and they said this was amazing and we want to do more. So they are um, co-presenting this conference with us. And what is Forward for Toby? They're an organization was, that was founded in 2013 because their good friend Toby lost her life to metastatic breast cancer and she used to come to these conferences. And she would go back to Chicago and tell her friends and her husband and her family how meaningful the weekend was to her. And so they reached out to us and said, how can we help? And I'm really pleased to say that we've, become, we've formed a great partnership. Um, so I'm going to bring up Jody, who is going to just say a few words before we continue on with the program. It should be Can y'all hear me? Yes. Wow, this is a little daunting. <laughs> I'm not, I don't think I can follow you as a public speaker. <laughs> well, I know I speak for our whole group when I say how, how real inspiring it is to be with you all today. For those that don't know us, we represent the Ford for Toby Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to helping women with metastatic breast cancer live a better quality of life. We started the foundation, as Jean said, in memory of our dear friend Toby, who was diagnosed at stage four and fought like hell to rid herself of this nasty, nasty beast. And through it all, through all the nausea, the hair loss, and the constant pain, she always talked about giving back. She talked about giving back to her Mets sisters, as she would call it. She wanted to help pay the mortgage, drive people to chemo, she wanted to provide childcare, and she simply wanted to make all of her Met sisters' lives better. Toby also found comfort in this conference, the LB LBBC conference, meeting women who were struggling with the same issues she was struggling with. Of course, she loved being with us, her childhood friends, but we really didn't understand. 
what she was going through. But you all did. And so when she passed away, we were determined to deliver upon her wish. We decided to start this foundation solely focused on making her Met sisters' lives just a little bit better. Partnering with various hospitals in the Chicagoland area for starters and then into Boston, we've provided money for rent and mortgages. We've paid for kids to attend camp. We've provided transportation to chemo for starters. And for the second year in a row, we're providing travel grants for many of you to offset the cost of traveling to this really, really important meeting. If she were here today, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if she were here today, I think she would have loved to talk to you all. For those that did meet Toby, she's just a light in the room, and we're trying to just keep that light shining bright. Um, so I think she would have loved to talk to all of you, especially to those that have received the travel grant. She would have not wanted a thank you, but she would have probably said to you, why don't, why don't you just pay it forward? As a side note, she probably would have looked at me and said, really, you're wearing that outfit today? <laughs> Um, but that's another story altogether. Um, so as long as we have these funds, we're going to continue to pay it forward because we care about you. We want to minimize some of your financial burden so you can focus all of your energy on what's important, which is really being with your friends and family and fighting this monster we call metastatic breast cancer. So you all keep fighting, and we'll be here to help. And we ask three things, okay? Come visit us at the booth. If you're on social media, just like us on Facebook and, and talk about us. We want, we want to be known because the more people that know us, the more people will give to us and the more we can give back. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you guys at the booth. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we do have a few other organizations that fund our travel grants. Um, the Amerisource Bergen Foundation has come on, and they are really supportive. And I also have to thank Southwest Airlines, who provides us with 61 tickets every year to bring people to programs. Um, so we're really, really pleased to have this support. I also want to thank our conference sponsors. Um, our leadership sponsor this year is Lilly Oncology, and Novartis is our presenting sponsor, two companies that have been really incredibly generous to Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and we really appreciate that. We also want to thank Genentech, AstraZeneca, Azi, Myriad, Celgene, and our good friends at Chico's FAS, who own the brands White House Black Market, Chico's, and Soma. They have been our biggest retail partner for 12 years, um, giving us over $7 million. So if you like those brands, <laughs> shop them. <laughs> um, but also, please look at the program, and we have other sponsors, and we want to thank them as well. Make sure you visit the booths today. The, the exhibits will be open all day, and um, they, they're, they're all incredibly supportive. OK, um, I also just want to say that this conference would not be possible without my staff. Um, the staff of Living Beyond Breast Cancer is unbelievable. You probably met a bunch of them last night. I'm sure you'll see them today. Some of them will be speaking from the podium. And I always say this, but you know, you might want to ask them, where's the bathroom? Or my, I don't like my sandwich. Or you know, it's too cold in the room. And that's fine. You can tell them that. But also, please say thank you at some point, because the, these people work incredibly hard. We, we start working on this conference a year out. OK, so now we're going to move into the program. So you're going to hear from two speakers. You'll first hear from Dr. Borges for about 20 minutes. Then you'll hear from Dr. Fuqua for 20 minutes. And then we will have 30 minutes of questions and answers. Remember, we take all questions by text. So whether you're watching via, via live stream or if you're in the room, um, you need to text your question. The number, and we'll have it on the screen, but is 610-365-7532. And you can start texting at any point. Janine and I will be working on sorting through the questions. I think it'll, it'll be up, right, Sharon? We'll, we'll have it up. 
But I will say it again, 610-365-7532. Um, okay, so to get started, I am really pleased to introduce you to Dr. Ginger Borges, who is the, head, the deputy head of the Division of Medical Oncology at the Robert F. and Pat Patricia Young Endowed Chair in the Young Women's Breast Cancer Research at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. She established this Young Women's Program in 2004, and she leads a dynamic team of physicians, scientists, and devoted staff who really specializes in, in the needs of young women. Um, but I think for us, the most important thing about Dr. Borges is she has been a really, really longtime friend of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. I think you've been speaking at our programs for many years, so you're all in for a big treat to hear from Dr. Borges. Good, good morning, everyone. Morning. Very happy to be here. Um, as Jean said, I go by Ginger. On paper, I'm Dr. Virginia Borges, and I currently hail from the University of Colorado in Denver, but I am a Jersey girl. And so coming back here is a little bit like coming home, and it's always great to be here and to see how many ladies and their care providers, and I think I even saw perhaps a gentleman um, who is here to learn about metastatic breast cancer. So thank you all for being here. I was asked today to speak about kind of what's going on in the world of clinical research. Where are we with the trials that are ongoing, things that you should know about and be able to avail yourself of. But I also always like to talk a little bit about just sort of the perspective of what metastatic breast cancer has looked like over time. Um, you know, why is today a time to be far um, more hopeful than perhaps we could have been 20 years ago when talking to a room full of folks who are dealing with life with metastatic breast cancer? We'll delve into a little bit of what personalized medicine actually means and what it could do for you today as well as what it could do for you tomorrow and what you can be a part of now that will not only help you today in your fight against this disease, but help continue to turn the tides and go through some very specific advances of just the last few years. Uh, the last time I did a plenary session for LBBC was in 2014. And so as I was looking to figure out what slides to show today, I went back and reviewed those slides. And it is really very gratifying to realize that I, I couldn't use any of those slides again because too much has simply changed. Um, the picture is not to brag simply about how cute my dog is. <laughs> but as many of you know, simply looking at a picture of a puppy or a baby can release oxytocin into your brain and cause you to relax. And I want you to relax because you're dealing with metastatic breast cancer. This is a very personal topic. I am a doctor talking to a room full of a lot of people. Nothing I say here today directly impacts you, so please don't hear my words and have them bring any anxiety to your morning. This is meant to be inspiring and hopeful, but sometimes I will show slides that have statistics. Those stats aren't you, girlfriend, okay? So don't, don't, don't get worried, and, and if you get worried, bring up a question later. But I understand it's not easy sometimes to hear about this topic when it's a very personal one. So I've been doing this for 20 years, and just to give you some perspective, in 1998 when I began my career, we basically had two drugs that we could use all the time. You probably all know about adriamycin and cytoxan. Taxotere was actually the hot new drug, brand new, on the market. Taxol hadn't even made it into the treatment of early stage breast cancer yet, and there was a whole long list of good old fashioned chemo moldy oldies, and that was pretty much all we had. Um, I was in training to be a bone marrow transplanter for breast cancer. That's how old I am. And also the turn of an era of where we were really linked into nothing but chemotherapy and trying to do more or give it differently or do massive doses and really not very sophisticated or smart about the biology of the cancers that we were trying to treat. 
Um, some of you may have heard of the drug Herceptin. That was the year it was first FDA approved, and I'm gonna cover that a little bit. And then also some of you may have been treated with the drug Facilidex for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. That is the year that that drug was approved. And I cut my teeth on the clinical trials for those two drugs, so it's pretty funny that now they're like the old boring ones that everybody is like, oh, here on that. Um, <laughs> So where are we today, 20-some-odd uh, years later? There's a whole long list of things, so many things that there is absolutely no ability for me to do justice to all of the advances that have come out in the past 20 years. But some of you are probably at the moment on drugs, things like mTOR inhibitors, um, Everolimus or Afinitor, the CDK4-6 inhibitors. We have three of them now, palbociclib, ribociclib, abemaciclib. You may know them better as um, Ibrantz and Kisqually, the ones that have been around a little bit longer. Great drugs, rewriting how we treat metastatic breast cancer not just in the ER positive space, studies going on in other subsets of the diseases as well. If anybody in the room has ever heard of BRCA and might have that as a part of their equation, we now have an FDA approved PARP inhibitor on the market available as a single agent looking to be almost as effective or as effective as chemotherapy for gals with BRCA driven um, cancers and it's a pill. Um, Herceptin was 20 years ago. We now have five targeted HER2 drugs on the market in the pharmacy and available. And there's a reality to individual ke uh, cancer gene assessments. When I started my training, it was almost science fiction, the idea that you could biopsy somebody's breast cancer and learn about its fingerprint in an in-depth way. And now there's commercially available tests that compete with each other to try and get me to order theirs versus another one. And there's pros and cons to all of them. So it's great to be living in the time that we are. And it allows you to work with your team of care providers and say, okay, I'm not just triple negative. I'm just not her too. I'm just not triple positive. I'm that and more. And what can these tests tell us about the more? And realize you're more. I'm talking about your tumor, but that's a doctor speak, you know. Um, you have to realize when I started in my career as a medical oncologist, the term triple negative breast cancer did not exist. Okay? All we knew about was the estrogen receptor. And so now not only does it exist, but it's actually starting to be identified in very unique ways, and we're gonna cover that today too. And the amount of clinical trial opportunities are completely explosive. In the beginning of my career, clinical trials were basically drug A plus drug B versus drug A plus drug C. And there wasn't a tremendous amount of excitement about that. It was really side effect management. Now the list is so um, mind blowing that we'll just touch on a few of them today and that's not meant to do anyone short shrift. I just had to choose. So one of the things that I'll highlight is what I think is a particularly important ongoing clinical trial, particularly for those gals who are standing up with the newbies in the room who have been doing this for um, a year or less. This is a large cooperative group study, so it's available across the entire United States, and it's geared towards gals who are diagnosed upfront with breast cancer who don't have a whole lot of spots, don't have a whole lot of tumors on their radiologic scans. And it's the idea of we've known for a very long time that when a woman gets diagnosed with breast cancer in the upfront setting, if we do combination therapy, surgery, radiation, chemo, drugs, we have a higher likelihood of curing that woman than if we only did one of those things or two of those things. And so it's taking that concept and applying it in a way that potentially opens up the door for using the C word in the setting of metastatic breast cancer, which would be to apply multimodality therapy. Should we radiate the spots? Should we operate on some? A doc like me has to come in and give you those drugs and make sure things are staying stable. But it's the idea that we could really move the field forward so that stage four might not really be stage four um, in the same way by the time uh, the next 10 years passes. And so what this does is it takes gals who have just a few spots of disease that can be seen on their scans, and few is a changing parameter. It started off as two or less, but we've done some groundwork over the last couple of years, so for certain sites of the of disease in the body, it's expanding up to four. Um, and then you're either treated with the usual thing that your medical oncologist would give you, depending on what subtype of breast cancer you have, the uh, soup du jour, if you will, or you are given that, but at the same time we go in and we either radiate or cut out all of the visible spots of disease, whichever way is safest to do. And so um, this is basically everyday life of what we do right now in the clinic. And this is basically taking the concept of the multidisciplinary care many women experience in 
uh, upfront diagnosis with stage one or stage two and bringing it back to stage four. And our hope is that we will create a stable of women who are going to be living for a very long time without their disease then showing up next. And there's a whole bunch of immune correlates and different science being applied to some of the samples that we'll take in this study so that we can really learn who would most benefit from this versus who, uh, for whom this would not be a good approach and we can spare them the toxicity of those added treatments. Um, and then I'm gonna move quick because there's a lot to cover, but I wanna jump track a little bit and tell you about um, where we are right now with HER2 positive breast cancer. And it's kind of an interesting story of a gene, its drug, and where we are going to go in the future. And I use this to be representative because it's the best case study of how we can markedly change the outcome of a subtype of breast cancer simply by knowing a target and hitting it correctly. So as some of you know, HER2 is a gene. It's in every single one of our cells, mine included. And in a subset of breast cancers, that gene is a part of what went wrong that turned that normal healthy breast cell into a tumor. And we can use that gene against the tumor. But in the beginning, before we knew that, we couldn't. We didn't really know how to handle it. And we had some very sad statistics. The beginning of my career, less than 30% of the women who got diagnosed with a HER2 positive breast cancer would beat it. And I can tell you today that those statistics have been turned on their heads such that we have um, survival outcomes approaching 94% in some of our clinical trials of what we are doing today for this subset of disease. And that's just in the last 20 years. Um, but to give you an idea of how long it took us to get there, and this is meant to give you an illustration of now where we stand, HER2 was first described in 81, but it took until 98 to get a targeted drug approved. Back then, the clinical trial process was quite a bit slower, and we didn't even really understand what this gene did or who had it or how best to test everyone for it. The understanding of the molecular biology techniques to figure out whose cancer even was going to respond to targeted therapies was in its infancy. This was very much the learning curve of how to take science and marry it with clinical medicine and turn how we treat a breast cancer upside down and save women's lives. Um, I entered the scene around the late 90s when I was a fellow in my training and I was the one in charge of putting women on the randomized clinical trial that eventually got the drug approved at the institution where I trained. And I'll just tell you, I met a girl. Back then she was a few years older than me, which meant she was 31. And um, she had this cancer, it was a very bad cancer and my textbooks taught me that she probably wasn't gonna be with us for very long. She had gone through a bone marrow transplant and her cancer had come back. And she had this gene nobody had heard of and she came onto this clinical trial and she got the study drug that nobody had heard of. And um, her name's Kim and she's alive today, 16 years later as a survivor of, um, of stage four inflammatory HER2 positive breast cancer. So not only was that a huge teaching point for me, um, but it made me a really strange oncologist because if you, the first patient you ever put on a clinical trial you more or less cure of something that's not supposed to be curable, um, you realize where the power of science lies. So now, fast forward, we have a whole litany of different drugs that target HER2, some of which are clinically available and some of which are in ongoing clinical studies. And I wanna give you an example of what I think is one of the future highlights of the field, um, something that is in clinical trials today. So if you have HER2 positive breast cancer, um, this might be important for you. Um, now, one of the issues with doing well with drugs like Herceptin and the early predecessors in the field is that success often creates more problems. And these are good problems to have, but they're hard problems to solve. So obviously, if we do well and we're able to keep our, our folks um, living well with breast cancer, including even metastatic breast cancer, sometimes the cancers continue to get tricky. And so one of the issues that we deal with now that I didn't have the privilege of dealing with 20 years ago is an epidemic of brain mets in our patients. My patients didn't live long enough for that to happen 20 years ago, and now it happens quite routinely, particularly in HER2 positive breast cancer. And so that's one of the hurdles that we need to um, still overcome. And one of the reasons for this is we have this thing called the blood-brain barrier. So our brain is a bit of a sanctuary site. And some of the drugs we use, including the bigger sized molecules like trastuzumab, which is Herceptin, or TDM1, which is Cadsila, sometimes they don't always get up there into the brain, although some of them do. And particularly once we start doing things like radiation to brain mets and that kind of stuff, it changes all of this. But what's needed are these drugs whose, whose generic names end in IB. 
they're small drugs, so they can cross barriers better. And so there's been drugs like lapatinib and now neratinib, which has recently been FDA approved. That one's called Neuralynx. And these are drugs that do do a good job of getting up into the brain better than their antibody predecessors, but there's still room for improvement. And so an ongoing clinical trial that is important for you guys to know about is this one called HER2 Climb. So tucatinib is yet another one of these drugs that targets HER2 and it gets up into the brain area quite well. And we have, uh, there's currently an ongoing phase two study that will be the registration trial. So if the results of this are um, proven that the drug is as good as we hope it is, this should lead to them being able to apply to get it FDA approved. Um, and so there have been about six prior studies of this drug, and it's had a few names. It was originally called Array 380 when I met it. Array is a small biotech company in Colorado, so that's how we found each other. And it was quite noticeable that even in the early setting, this drug could cause responses in women as just a pill, no combination with chemo. And so it was a pretty exciting drug to be a part of. We've done a couple of additional studies in combination with some of the other HER2 targeted therapies. And now the main study is going forward where tucatinib is being used in combination with capecitabine that you may know as Zalota and trastuzumab. And so that is um, a very exciting study right now. And one of the things that we saw in the early trials is that this is a medication that can really make brain metastases shrink and stabilize and not progress. So very, very cool for those of us who um, want to help our gals and very, very cool for those gals who have those things. This is a plot that's called a waterfall plot. And it's better to be on the down of the waterfall, and it's better to have the water go all the way down to the bottom. And what that means is this is the response of tumors. So as you can see on some of these clinical trials, whether a gal had brain mets or did not have brain mets, she received marked benefit from tucatinib. And that's important because in a lot of our clinical studies, brain mets is one of the things that would suggest that somebody might not benefit as much from the available drugs. And this is one of the ones that's exciting for us because it is. This is what we call a swimmer's plot. So the further you swim down the pool, the better, meaning the longer the person is living. And what's really impressive here is that there are gals who have been treated with this medication who are out over six months, out over a year, their cancer not progressing, and their brain mets not progressing. And did I mention this is a pill? Okay. So we're super excited to see this come forward. Um, the current study that's ongoing is for gals who have received pertuzumab and TDM1 previously and are a good candidate for the chemotherapy Zalota. And it is a randomized study. We don't know what everyone is getting, but it is ongoing and will help us get this drug to market um, worldwide right now. And we also have um, another problem related to HER2-positive breast cancer, which is it's not mutually exclusive from being ER-positive. Anyone in the room know the term triple positive or ER-positive, HER2-positive? Right. So that's emerged as kind of one of our other little bugaboos that we have to figure out in cancer medicine. If a tumor is both ER-positive and HER2-positive, they kind of work against each other. The therapies for the ER positive don't always work as well, and the therapies for the HER2 positive don't always work as well. So we have to kind of figure that out and come up with a mechanism to make them work in concert, not as antagonists to each other. And it's not a trivial subset of breast cancer, about 10% of all breast cancer. People just don't tend to think of it in that context. Um, and so we have an ongoing study right now. My colleague, Dr. Shaga Sultanova, who we all call Dr. Nova, um, is running this very exciting early phase study where we're using the standard of care for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, a combination of, in this case, letrozole and pablocecalib, and we're adding to it the tucatinib so that we're doing a two-punch ER positive, HER2 positive approach. And what's beautiful about this is it's all pills. I know how much it sucks to go to the infusion center, not personally, but because I walk through there and thank God that must suck. Um, and so keeping women out of the infusion center for years at a time at home, shopping at black, white, I love their clothes, um, you know, but, but doing far more fun things than sitting in a Barca lounger with an IV connected to them is, I think, extremely important. Plus, we want the availability of something like tucatinib that might prevent the emergence of brain metastasis in gals who are at a high risk for them. It's a simple study. Everybody gets the three drugs, they take them, and we see how things go. So if, if that's at all um, pertinent to you, let us know. 
So I'm going to jump gears again because we don't have much time and talk a little bit about triple negative breast cancer and where's the road ahead. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, triple negative has actually only existed since the early 2000s when these subsets were defined because we finally had the technology to do deep fingerprinting on cancers. And what's cool is that we already know that triple negative is not one type of breast cancer. It's many different types, some of which are driven by extremely important markers. Um, one that's emerging, not only for triple negative, but importantly for triple negative is the androgen receptor. And I won't say more about that because I think you're gonna hear about that further in a minute. But there is a cousin, a male cousin to the estrogen and progesterone receptor called the androgen receptor and it's very important. And we're actively figuring out how best to target that to improve treatment. I'm gonna talk about immune signatures here in a minute. We talked about the availability now of PARP inhibitors if somebody has a BRCA positive gene mutation. And there's even subsets of triple negative breast cancer that while the woman doesn't carry a gene mutation that she got from her folks, her cancer kind of has some mutations that make it look like it does. And so we can use some of these drugs in those subsets of breast cancer as well and a whole bunch of other targets. And I hypothesize, we can prove me right or wrong if I get invited back, um, that in the next 24 to 36 months, we will have a drug approved specifically for triple negative breast cancer in the metastatic setting. <laughs> but unlike the story of HER2, where it took us over a decade to even go from understanding what HER2 was to its first drug approval, we're gonna be a much shorter timeline than that from understanding of triple negative to its first drug approval. And it's not just gonna be one drug for five years. Right? It took a long time for the second HER2 drug to make it to market. We're going to have an explosion of drugs specifically for triple negative breast cancer in the next five to ten years. And so that was my point of giving you the history lesson of where HER2 went. Because I also showed you that we took a cancer that was quite mortal, quite deadly, made triple negative actually look pretty good um, 20 years ago. And now it's something that if you're HER2 positive, well, yeah, you got to do all the treatment, but, you know, it's, it's not a a thing that people can't survive anymore. And so that picture there, I did mention I was a Jersey girl. That's JBJ, John Bon Jovi. He was in Denver last month, so I crossed off an item on my bucket list. But the point is that I don't want you to think of life as living on a prayer, okay? I want you to think of life as it's my life because science is gonna help you live that. In my last few minutes, I'll just give a nice shout out to the immune system because it's been with us forever, but it's been hiding in terms of how we've truly been able to understand it. Interestingly, breast cancer is one of the biggest nuts to crack in terms of how it interacts with the immune system. Um, <clears throat> I could take blood from every woman in this room with metastatic breast cancer and blood from every woman in this room without metastatic breast cancer or breast cancer at all, and it would be extremely difficult to find differences in how your immune system is currently functioning. And that's because women in general tend to be quite healthy and have healthy immune systems and breast cancer doesn't tend to impact the immune system quite as much as in diseases like lung cancer and melanoma and other cancers where you have heard that immunotherapy has been kind of a slam dunk. So it's not that immunotherapy isn't going to work for metastatic breast cancer or breast cancer in general, it's just we have to be a little bit smarter about figuring it out how. So this is a really cute picture of a breast cancer surrounded by immune cells, and this is actually from my lab. This level of technology of being able to stain the blue cancer cells and then stain all those little different colored rainbow cells, which are different subsets of the immune system, and figure out who the good guys are and who the bad guys are and who's behaving and who's not behaving is real enough that um, uh, most cancer labs can do this type of work today. It didn't even exist five, seven years ago. And so I can see, just under a microscope, whether somebody's cancer is totally shutting out the immune system or if somebody's cancer is actually directly talking to and the immune cells are moving in. <coughs> and, um, and that's allowing us to figure out whose cancers on a personalized basis might be most beneficial to putting them onto an immunotherapy. And you, you'd have to live under a rock to have not heard about the immune therapies called checkpoint block inhibitors that are making their way through all of cancer, including breast cancers. So a checkpoint block inhibitor is just something that turns on in your immune system when you get sick so that your immune system, after it's cleared, whatever is making you sick, turns off. 
If your immune system doesn't turn off effectively, you get extremely sick. So the immune system is a little bit of a yin and yang. Too much, bad thing. Too little, bad thing. In cancer, it's usually too little because the immune system is actually co-opting, excuse me, the cancer is co-opting how your immune system works and sort of putting it to sleep. It's singing it a nasty lullaby. It's like a siren. And so you have to shut that off so the immune system can wake up and recognize the cancer for what it is and turn around and kill it. And that's what these drugs help your body do. So these drugs are the first that don't really attack the cancer itself at all. It talks to your immune system and says, hey guys, hello, do you see this? <laughs> and then your immune system can go, oh, okay, and go attack the cancer. And that's critically important because that allows your body to understand the cancer and do ongoing surveillance, which is why people who benefit from these drugs tend to benefit them from them for an extremely long time. Um, all of these drugs end in eluzumab, so if you hear pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, nivolumab, these are all drugs that are in that class. And the one that is currently in ongoing clinical trials is pembrolizumab, and well, all of them are in ongoing clinical trials. But pembrolizumab is in a um, number of clinical trials and probably the first one that's gonna get put forward to market, although atezolizumab is close on its heels. Any opportunity to be on a clinical trial involving one of these drugs in combination with whatever else might be beneficial for your cancer would be a really good thing for you to look into. Um, and there's a lot of them ongoing right now. There's some for ER positive, there's some for triple negative, there's some for HER2 positive. And what's nice is this drug has already made it into the upfront setting of early stage disease. Some of you may have heard of a clinical trial called iSpy. It's been running for a very long time in the United States by, led by a surgeon out at UCSF, Laura Esserman. And so that's women who are getting the standard chemo of the day, and they either do or do not receive an experimental drug on top of it. And pembrolizumab was one of those experimental drugs, and what it showed was it markedly improved the number of women who had complete cell killing from their upfront chemotherapy before they went to surgery. So that's a very high bar in our world. A drug that does that makes us go, all right. So we're very excited to see these drugs coming forward. Um, as I said, Pembro is in a number of different studies right now, including a registration trial. And so availing yourself of that, if you can, would be a great idea. Um, another cool drug that's making its way down the market for um, a meta, a triple negative breast cancer is sac Tuzumab, or we just call it MU-132. This targets something called trope 2. You've probably never heard of trope 2. It's yet one of those markers that we can fingerprint in triple negative and other breast cancers that we have now identified a very cool targeted drug. And what's cool about this drug is like some of the other biologic drugs, Herceptin and its cousins, um, it has um, it's a little bit of a Trojan horse, right? So it's an antibody that will bind to the trope 2, but then it delivers the chemotherapy drug into the cancer cell. So it spares the human body the effect of the chemo sort of being seen everywhere. It allows it to only be seen inside the cancer cells where we want it. So a bit of a smart bomb technology. And this one we've had in clinical trial, as have many institutions across the U.S., with quite impressive results. It's always gratifying to see tumors kind of melting away, and we don't always get that. So this is one that I would say keep your eyes on for the future. So lastly, since my time is up, I'll just comment on another thing that you could do today, regardless of where you are in your cancer journey. You could be NED right now and not even need to be on treatment, and this would be something that you could be a part of. And being a part of it may benefit you directly, but it will also give you some good karma because it's kind of the way of the future. Everything I showed you was built upon the backs of individual investigators, individual groups, individual pharmacology, uh, excuse me, pharmaceutical companies, individual clinical trials. It was a highly effective means of getting some extremely important drugs to market and good therapies for our patients available today. But it is not the power of what we could actually accomplish. While we have been figuring out molecular biology and cool ways to stain cancer cells to make adorable pictures of bright immune cells, 
our geek colleagues in the computer world have also been figuring a whole lot of very important things out. And it's time to work with them as our new partners in science because big data and the ability to, in, to crunch enormous amounts of information through the IT explosion that has happened is what's gonna be the next big game changer. So Orion is one of the groups that exists in the United States right now that's doing big data, big science. There are others, there's Genie, there's a whole bunch of really special groups that are coming together and saying, let's not do this alone anymore. Let's make a partnership where we all get into the same sandbox and figure out stuff faster. So Orion stands for Oncology Research Information Exchange Network. And right now, um, this is actually a little bit outdated. There's now 16 cancer centers um, involved. Uh, we've got Rutgers across the river and all over the United States, a few others having infilled. And so this is a group of people who have decided to open up one common protocol, enroll, enroll folks with cancer, all cancers, any type of cancer, and get them to put their data into a database. They will be followed for life. And also, if they have some tumor available that's not being used, send that off for deep sequencing, that deep fingerprinting that you hear about to figure out the genes that are on and off and playing a role in how their cancer is behaving. And what's nice about this is it's not meant to be a stagnant amount of research that we learn something from that may, 10 years from now, have a clinical trial ongoing. This is a direct private-public partnership. There are pharmaceutical companies that are contributing and helping pay for the science that's being done. And the idea is that the patients who sign up, if they have their tumor fingerprinted, if five years from now, or maybe sooner than that, if we can get it there, if a new drug comes along that has a target, they will be in a database. And so they can be identified as having that target. And they can receive a letter saying, hey, how you doing? You have a target. We have a drug. You want to talk? And so it would be a whole new way of identifying patients across the United States at once who could potentially be eligible for a clinical trial that may or may not benefit them. That is far better than you at 11 o'clock at night on the internet thinking, have I found everything out there? <laughs> so a few thoughts I'll leave you with. We all know that for all subtypes of breast cancer, but in particular our friends who have the triple negative, science needs to move faster, and it is. Estrogen receptor positive breast cancers need even more ongoing options for prevention of the loss of sensitivity to estrogen, and many of them are here today. There's more to follow, good ones coming. We get better. Once we learn a target, we get better at how to target it. There are so many new targets that we are currently figuring out as to what role they play in breast cancer across all the subtypes of breast cancer, and then including how to interact with the immune system, that this is just gonna get additive and additive and additive. And personalized medicine is here now. Figure out how you can be a part of it, whether it's Orion or your institution's version thereof. It's important that those who um, have cancers that they're dealing with right now take advantage of it and be a part of the process. So I'll just, tell you this, that um, you know, as somebody who takes care of a lot of gals with breast cancer, it does feel hard sometimes. If it feels hard on my side of the desk, I can only imagine what it feels hard on your side of the desk. But a survival that once upon a time was only a few years or six months is now many years for some. There are women in this room now who have metastatic breast cancer who will not die of it. I can't tell you who you are, but I hope it's more of you, and more and more and more as years go by. Um, the only reason we've made this progress is because of some very brave women who are willing to be my co-investigators and put their faith in something that we really did not know whether or not it was going to work. And many of them did not benefit from it directly, and they're not here today to be a part of this conference, but they'd be pretty okay with my slides. They'd be happy. And so that's my email. If anything I have said has triggered something in you, feel free to reach out to me. We also do remote second opinions if we can ever be of help in finding things. And lastly, another picture, more oxytocin. Don't forget to take care of yourselves. That's something called puppy yoga. You do yoga and they release a pack of puppies to come <laughs> run around. And you just really can't let, take life too seriously when you're getting kissed by a puppy trying to hold boat pose. So whatever makes it work for you, please find it and do it and do it often. I wish you all the best in your health and I hope to see you here when I'm back in, I don't know, three, four years.
standing ovation. Thank you so much, Dr. Bork. Gorgeous. Um, for those of you who live stream, she just got a standing ovation in case you didn't see the, the audience shot. I'm going to bring up our next speaker in a second, but I just want to say just a few things. Um, Janine and I have been monitoring the text, so happy you guys are asking questions. For those of you that want to know the number again, it's 610-624-5671. Um, we have heard from a couple of the men in the audience who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And we want to acknowledge that we know that men do get breast cancer, and we certainly are sensitive to that at Living Beyond Breast Cancer, so we, we are hearing you. Um, also want to let you know that these slides will be available, so don't feel like you have to write everything down. The PowerPoint is available, as well as the live talk, because we are videotaping it. And for those of you who want to tweet, our hashtag today is hashtag LBBC Mets Conference. So feel free to tweet out messages as you hear. So um, next, I'll bring up our second speaker, Dr. Suzanne Fuqua, who is a bench scientist. She has a bachelor's degree and a master's degree from the University of Houston, and her PhD is in cancer biology from the University of Texas Graduate School of Biomedical Science. She is a professor of medicine and molecular and cellular biology at Baylor College of Medicine. And I know a lot of her research has focused on um, hormone positive disease, but her um, bio is so complicated, I hate just reading words when I don't understand them. So what I will tell you is, um, for many of us who go to the San Antonio meeting, and if you haven't gone to the San Antonio meeting every December, that's a great place for advocates to go, or if you're living with breast cancer, um, they really welcome you there, and there's always a meeting that um, every evening called Hot Topics run by the Almo Breast Cancer Foundation. And they bring up some of the top scientists and doctors to sort of say, okay, what did we learn today at this medical meeting and how can advocates understand it? And we all heard Dr. Fuqua and I said, we have to get her <laughs> to Philadelphia to our conference. So um, I think hearing from a scientist is, is gonna be a little bit different than hearing from Dr. Borges, who's a clinician, but equally important in this effort to um, one day cure breast cancer. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's actually a pleasure to see so many caregivers here. That's fantastic. The hot topics, we don't have as many caregivers. And Virginia, that was a great talk. Where'd she go? <laughs> You'll have to tell her. <laughs> I was gonna say, I need yoga with the puppies. My puppy's 85 pounds. I'm not even sure I could. <laughs> okay, so I am a basic scientist, but I'm, I'm really gonna take you guys easy. No graphs, not much molecular biology, but just really an overview of what we've learned. It's, it's really been an exciting time. So I have focused my career on the estrogen receptor. So I'm called the estrogen receptor lady. Some people call me grand lady, but it's okay, call me lady. Um, so that is the first group there, the ER positive, PR positive, hormone therapy uh, that Ginger didn't talk as much about because she knew I'd be following her. And the drugs we have are the aromatase inhibitors and tamoxifen. And really I'm going to tell a story about targeted therapy and how that's actually changed metastatic breast cancer. Uh, Ginger spent a little bit of time talking about the HER2 positive, which there are two types, either with or without the receptor and the agents that you use. And it's actually, I'm going to tell you a quick story just because of what she said. So we start targeting HER2. I see it like a seesaw. We hit this target, and there's this other target called estrogen receptor. So we do a good job at knocking this down. But what happens? ER goes up. So we've learned we have to get this balance. And the reason I tell you that, because that's told me a lot about how the estrogen receptor is working when it stops working, when we use therapy and the therapy stops working. So keep that seesaw in mind while I, I talk about this. And then, of course, triple negative, uh, which Ginger spent most of her time on, and I don't work a lot on, on triple negative. All right, so this is my simple slide. So you, when your tumor's diagnosed, you have a primary tumor, 
And you notice that it's colored like Easter eggs. That's what we've learned in the last 10, 15 years is that it's very heterogeneous. You can have different cells in there, okay? And that if we do therapy now, the, the drug of choice with the, the best results have been the aromatase inhibitors. So you're putting on aromatase inhibitors for five years. So we call that adjuvant therapy. And the thought of that is if you have any circulating clusters, and I have one drawn there, may be different colors than that primary tumor that may be hiding out in the body. And that's what adjuvant therapy is for. But the problem is that the tumor's smart. It doesn't want to be killed, okay? And so while you're doing that long time adjuvant therapy, the tumor goes, ha. Huh. I can figure out a way. What if I increase the number of yellow cells? And I'm going to tell you about the yellow cells, what they could be. What if I increase the number of yellow cells that may allow me to grow again? And that's metastatic breast cancer. It is figured out how to get around, to bypass the therapies that we're using. And so, you know, in my career, most of us have worked with primary tumors because we take them out in surgery. You ladies allow us to work with them for research purposes. But the problem with that is we're not looking at the main problem, right, ladies? It's, it's almost like, why didn't we know this? But now we are biopsying metastatic breast cancer. So the last few years has been a complete flip in how we look at a primary tumor compared to a metastatic tumor, and that's what I'll spend most of my time on. So what I'm going to talk about is something called clonal selection of mutations. That's where you take the red cell in the primary tumor, and you have more red cells in the metastatic tumor. And then acquired hormone resistance is where, again, the tumor is smart enough to figure out that this aromatase inhibitor is not going to stop me. I'm going to figure out a way around it, okay? So what we're trying to do with the next step is if you are diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer, we want to maintain hormonal therapy because it's still what kills ear positive cells, but use these other targeted therapies to the red or the yellow cells that restore sensitivity, gets rid of those bypass mechanisms. So does that make sense? Raise your hand if you got that part. All right, if you go home with that part, you learned from me today. All right, this was an experiment I did in early 2000, okay? We had a big tumor bank. Uh, I, I trained in San Antonio. Bill McGuire, who started the San Antonio Symposium, was my mentor, and he was one smart man. He was convinced that hormonal therapy was the way to go. And when um, he started a lab, and he would say, anyone in the United States, send me your tumor, and I'll measure the estrogen receptor for you for free if I can keep the residual tumor and look at it. So in that bank, I was able to find primary tumors. Those patients were treated with tamoxifen, the drug of choice in the late 90s. And then metastatic breast cancers, which my clinical fellows were treating these patients, and they were on tamoxifen, but they got a second cancer. They got metastatic breast cancer while they were on the drug. And I thought, you know, if I, as a, as a basic scientist, can have a sample, not only has learned how to metastasize, but to get around the drug while you're being given the drug, I thought that's got to be the best, best thing I can do. And I was laughed at because you see there's a few samples there, right? I was laughed at. But I think it's probably the best experiment I did in my life because I was working with metastatic breast cancer before we routinely had samples of it. And the, the, what, what I'm going to show here is the red and the blue. Okay, so the red means it had high levels of something. The blue means it had lost it or had low levels. Okay, so you got that part. You understand that experiment there. So what, I've, what I'm trying to do is two points here in this, in this slide. So in the patients that were responding to tamoxifen, the S's, the sensitive, tamoxifen sensitive, the tumor's toxin, tamoxifen sensitive, you still had growth suppressors on board. They were upregulated. So the, the tumor was still being braked, breaking itself, really, okay? But we had growth enhancers, and they were turned off. So again, the controls were in the correct way. You had the brakes on and things that can make it go, enhancers, were not expressed, they were in blue. And what we found, okay, in this one, two, three, four, five, five R's, five resistant patients, is that we would have the brakes released, so the suppressors would go down, and the growth enhancers would go up. You're up in the gas. So that's the take home message one. It's actually the drug. We figured out the mechanism. So what I did as a basic scientist, I said I'm gonna study these one at a time. 
okay? And we published on all of these. And, and so one at a time, I, I was starting to figure out that's what was going on when we were using these drugs, is that, and then in the papers, if I could block them, what happened? I restored sensitivity to the original drug that the patient was using. So it was a big life lesson for me, but you know what I've never done, ladies, and I promise you within a year I will, I will do it, is I've never shown this figure to anybody. Each one of those patients, if you'll look, God, they're so far away, it's hard to do. Well, I knew I was going to do that. Okay, it's the other one. All right, this patient has both the gas on and the brakes off. These hack things are happening at the same time. And when I started studying these individually, I forgot the big picture. The big picture is all of these are on at the same time, okay? And that we need multiple combination therapies. So right now, when the slide before I showed you, you have hormonal therapy and metastatic disease, and you give one target, and then we switch to another if you happen to recur, and if you recur, we do it again, okay? And what I'm figuring out in my career in the literature out there is that maybe we need to change how we do it, and I'll end on that slide. How I think we need to change. All right, so how does this happen? Okay, how does I call it reprogramming? Resistance is the tumor is reprogramming it, gramming itself, and saying, Whoa, I need some more gas, and I need to get rid of these growth suppressors if I want to grow in the face of drug. So, what do we do with estrogen receptor? We know the estrogen is the main pathway for growth. So, what happens when we do hormone therapy is the receptor goes out of where it's supposed to be, which is in the middle, called the nucleus and goes elsewhere and starts finding partners in crime. Now the example of this has been well worked out. One, this GFR, growth factor receptor. So that's the HER2 you heard, and there's a bunch of others. So it partners up with it and says, can you help me survive in the face of this hormone therapy that's blocking me from growing, okay? So what I showed you on the previous slides when I was looking at this uh, gene by gene is you see AR, the androgen receptor. So from that data I showed you, I was the first to publish that the N receptor is one of these helpers in crime, partners in crime that we have, okay? And what it's doing is actually partnering in both the locations out on the outside, to capture those mechanisms of resistance, and in the inside the receptor. And what it does is it gives you different bypass survival, these growth pathways. So right there, you need the ER-AR combination drug and uh, the drugs are coming on board. They reported in Zalutamide in San Antonio this year that if you indeed have the androgen receptor in your tumor at high levels, that's the, the clue, that the drugs may then restore sensitivity to hormone therapy. So that's the most recent example of, of trying to understand this mechanism. All right, so the other thing that, that when I arrived as a trainee, and I realized Ginger and I were probably trainees about the same time, in Bill McGuire's lab, I told you he, he worked on the estrogen receptor and he developed this large uh, tumor bank uh, by doing sampling for free. Well, um, I did something that, that was really, I think, the, the best thing, I, the best discovery I've made in my life is that I originally discovered ER mutations. So from those metastatic patients and other patients we had in the tumor bank, I did very deep sequencing before we had the commercial really, really fancy sequencing. We did it all by hand. But I found these mutations in, in 1997, so I was the beginning of my training career. Now, I'm going to tell you that I was very young at that time. I was <laughs> child, you believe me, a child prodigy. Um, <laughs> no, really. And um, <laughs> I, was, I was really a Girl Scout at that time. No, but I was a Girl Scout because I really thought that it was going to be quite an explosion and that it would change how we looked at metastatic breast cancer, but it did not. It took until 2013 for next generation sequencing and biopsies now being taken from patients for diagnostic purposes that five papers came out at one time that maybe Dr. Fuquay was correct. And so I'll tell you that I'm, I'm very excited uh, about that it's been validated. I'm very excited that women now are going to receive appropriate care. I'd also show you that I'm quite persistent. And I, I forgot to say when I came up because I didn't see Ginger is that, Ginger, I can tell you're a strong lady like I am. And I can tell I am surrounded by strong ladies here, okay? So what we know now 
is 40% of patients with metastatic breast cancer, if the ER positive, have these mutations. Okay? And that perhaps the switching from tamoxifen to an AI, I, I ask my clinicians, they don't see as many patients, metastatic patients, that have been treated with tamoxifen. More patients are on aromatase inhibitors. And I say that perhaps we are, we have caused this to happen. This is a result of being so good with our therapies. And we had mentioned, Ginger, you mentioned earlier about HER2 cancer now being found in the brain. Perhaps we're part of the problem, and these may be acquired during therapy of an aromatase inhibitor. Again, the cancer's smart. My estrogen's going away. What am I going to do about it? Okay, so I'm going to change the receptor, mutate the receptor into a receptor that doesn't care about hormone. It's hormone independent. Okay, so the two questions I do in my lab, and I'm going to speed up a little bit, is this clonal selection, and do these mutations really drive metastasis? We know they're resistant. They're hormone independent. They don't care about the drug. Okay, so, and then lastly, uh, we now know in, in clinical trials in the last three years that have reported that we do have drugs that are effective for ER mutations, full restraint and targeted therapies, that patients with these mutations also respond to these drugs. So that's the good news, okay? But as a basic scientist, I really want to kill this beast. I've been a long time working on this one, so I'm going to get it. All right. There's my patient, by the way. He's, he's really kind of cute. And unlike the hairy ones, he's called athymic. He doesn't have an immune system, so I can put a tumor into him, okay? And it, it won't fight back. And so I can study properties. So in my, my mouse patient, okay, I did a, an experiment. Now, this isn't published yet. It's still being reviewed. That's part of the process. We have a scientist. But here what I did was I took different, oh, I keep doing that. I learned finally. There we go. Either wild type receptor, normal, or mutant. I've labeled the red, I've, read, I've labeled the mutant cells in red, the normal cells in green, and I've mixed them in different combinations and then put them into the mouse, okay? What we see is on the right-hand side, with which group were either the 1%, 10%, 50%, uh, I forget, 90%, you see an increase in metastasis, okay? What does that tell you? That tell you, and then we look at it, and you can see it either by color, which I've graphically shown here, all the metastatic tumors that arose, and here you can look at the picture, they're all red. There's no green in there. The mutant's dominant. It's one nasty thing that we have to kill. But biologically, it's telling you it's really driving the metastasis. So they, it was a basic question. Are the genes that are causing resistance to our drugs also causing the metastatic properties? And the answer, we think, is yes with this data. OK, so in the last maybe uh, three to five years, this explosion of sequencing. Patients now will have a metastatic biopsy many times taken, if, if possible, medically possible. So uh, you can see the small numbers down on the right-hand side there. Uh, they had this many metastatic tumors, 149, and then we have a database, that big data that Ginger was talking about. Now this slide looks terrible, but what it is comparing the primary and saying what's different in the metastasis. Because up to about five years ago, everybody thought they were saying there's no reason to biopsy the metastatic tumor. Okay? Even though there were small reports like mine earlier that there may be differences. All right. So the slide's complicated, but what I'll take you through it real quick. What is the tumor doing? Remember those growth factor receptors like HER2? It's upregulating it, okay? What about genes I told you that were important for growth? It's upregulating it. Red is it's increasing, it's amplifying it. What about those loss of growth, the two, what we call tumor suppressors I showed you, switched in the metastatic patient? Yep, that's what's happening. You're losing those growth suppressors. And then, of course, the estrogen receptor is the most highly acquired mutation that we have in metastatic, breast, in, in metastatic breast cancer. So what this is telling you, again, is what I tried to make in that pictorial slide with the colors, is that the tumor's smart, it's hitting the right things, 
and it's happening in medic specifically in metastatic breast cancer. And now we, as uh, researchers and physicians, have to tackle this problem. So this is how my view has changed of breast cancer. When I discovered the ER mutations and then gene by gene, I was looking at gene by gene as resistance mechanisms. Somehow they were causing your tumor to progress and that we were doing single gene targeted, for instance, um, an aromatase inhibitor plus a CDK4-6, aromatase inhibitor plus something else. But I think what we know now is just like this in this game, they can pop up. There are multiple escape mechanisms, many mutations, and there's this heterogeneity. You know, when I, and when I first hit this a couple of years ago now, this, this has been evolving in my brain, I was going, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, the good news is we're getting real smart, and there are a lot of drugs coming online. Drugs coming online. So I think this is the best thing yet, because as you said, smart bombs. If we can hit these while they're going up, before they become established and really cause metastatic uh, recurrence, we, we can do this. We just have to get the concept that it may be a little more complicated how we're going to do the treatments and the biologics that we're going to be using. So this is just a, a, a slide to end on. So we've gone from we have your primary tumor and we're going to treat you for your metastatic disease based on what you had before to if we can, either we're going to take blood where we can measure it are, we may be able to biopsy if we can get to the metastatic site, and we're going to treat you according to what we see by the little bit we know. But now we're getting to where we know a lot. We can do whole genome sequencing very, very cheap. So my thought is not only do we have to think about how we're going to change and be more flexible and um, driven by exactly your tumor, the personalized medicine, but maybe we need to move it forward. and that's shows is that perhaps up front we need to be monitoring during those five years of hormone therapy. We need to see what's going on as a consequence of the therapy and anticipate it and beat it before it gets us, gets to us, okay? All right. Um, some of the questions, so if, if you like any of these questions, you can, you, you can text them and we'll see uh, if we have time to discuss them. So ER mutations now are known to be a frequent mechanism of acquired resistance and the important things that they're actually driving metastasis, we think, from preclinical data. Um, AI therapy alone in the metastatic setting is probably counterindicated in mutant positive patients. We need to sequence for gene alterations in metastatic breast cancer both before and during therapy. Even with our best new target therapies, I think there is a profound new way for sequencing strategies novel therapies, and as again, perhaps uh, in, in, the, in the last one, maybe we need to be using some of these drugs earlier at the emergence of resistance so we can quickly restore hormone sensitivity. And then finally, um, we've had the, um, the pleasure of hosting the Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference in, in uh, Houston. I'm at Baylor College of Medicine for the last couple of years and it's moving to Baltimore next year. So this was just something I wanted to, to end on uh, the, about this conference. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for devoting your life to this. It's, it's really what happens in the lab that makes it possible for us to find the right drug. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. I was giving you the wrong number to text, so I think <laughs> I'm doing a lot of things wrong this morning, but um, it's 610-624-5772. But some of you are figuring it out anyway. Um, so Janine and I are going to alternate asking questions. Um, but let's start, because we have a lot of questions, um, Ginger, about is it going to go 610-624-5672? Oh, 
Um, so we're getting a lot of questions about when is it time to, to explore a clinical trial? Sort of at what, you know, should you always be looking or at what point? So I would make the argument that it is always worthwhile to know what are your options. It doesn't mean that at any given moment in your disease course, the clinical trial will be your best choice. And a lot of it has to do with timing of what you need and what just happened. So for example, um, if a woman found out in the last year or so that her estrogen receptor positive breast cancer has come back, gotten one of those ESR1 mutations or somehow survived despite the upfront treatment that she had done, the current frontline treatment, the current standard of care with the combination therapies such as the CDK4-6 inhibitors, that's your pavlocyclibs, your ribocyclibs, um, known as Ibrance or Kisqually, you know, they were yesterday's hot clinical trial that did so well that the drugs are already FDA approved. So most of the current clinical trials that are ongoing um, would actually require that you have had that therapy before you could be eligible for coming on and testing something that's not yet certain. Um, never lose sight of the fact that the stuff that's approved got approved because it's already passed muster. Um, it, it was at one point the headlines. And so it's just a matter of where you are and what has recently come about versus what is on the horizon. Now, you know, that being said, there could be something available not far from where you live that would be the current combination therapy that's the latest and greatest with or without something else added in, right? Yet another drug that might be a triple play, like you were hearing Dr. Fuqua mention, we're learning that it's gonna have to be combinations of things, not just one drug or two drug, that's eventually gonna really help us figure out how to tamp down the emergence of that resistance. So if there's one in the place where you're being treated and it would be uh, straightforward for you to be a part of it, knowing that you're gonna get the latest and greatest anyway, and you may or may not get this other therapy on top of it, to me, that's a no-brainer if, if you can do it. But, you know, there comes a time in somebody's care where it may make sense for them to travel or be less convenient um, if you're not at, you know, I mean, right now we're in Philly, you can't swing a cat without hitting a major medical center, but you go out to Denver and there's one academic center in the entire state, so some patients have to travel eight hours to see me, it has to make a lot of sense for them to be on a clinical trial to come get treatment with me as opposed to their great community oncologist who's two blocks down the road. So it's all just kind of a matter of where you are, but you definitely want to know what your options are at all times. So it's the same number that's on the screen. It'll be the same text number all day long. So write that down. That should be the number 610-365-7532. I'm going to quickly give, give a question so we can get to some of your really terrific questions. Um, and I think this is probably addressed to both of you. If metastatic breast cancer evolves and eventually outsmarts formerly, formerly effective treatment, why do we use treatment until it fails rather than switching treatment before the cancer becomes resistant? <laughs> um, that one's, I start okay. with the easy questions. <laughs> um, well, there's, there's two thoughts to that. One is, the idea of switching would require that you can foresee the future because some of these therapies and combinations of therapies can benefit a woman for years. And if a woman is doing well on her therapy, particularly if it's not having a lot of side effects and she is living her life, taking a shot or taking some pills, I don't know that you would wanna take her off of that prematurely and switch her to something that may not be effective at all or come with much higher side effect profile. So the dogma is usually if you're on the horse and you're winning the race, you don't look at the horse next to you and say, that one looks good. Um, <laughs> but I, I think it would be lovely, and this is what we're getting at, is the idea that right now, biopsying of tumors is potentially painful, potentially risky. Technology is evolving that it might be the possibility of a blood test looking for little tidbits that the tumor sheds off into our bloodstreams 
um, that could allow us to kind of foresee what that tumor is thinking about and in what direction it's trying to evolve its resistance. Because the problem is, is it's not like tumors evolve resistance in a sequential pattern that we can predict. So if someone is on something and it's working, yeah, maybe even if we could foretell that it's not gonna keep working for the next six months, we don't know in what way it's changing. So the technology will be here before my next 20 years of career are over that Right now you get a tumor marker, right? Y'all love that little CA2729 or 15.3 or whichever one your doctor might use. Okay, that's, that's nice. It's a surrogate for what might be going on in your body, but it's a very inelegant, fundamentally unuseful tool. It just creates a lot of anxiety. Um, what would be far better is if we could do serial blood work that would actually inform us of, oh look, your, your last CAT scan might look fantastic, but we're starting to see some changes in the profile of what's happening in your blood. So not only should we probably switch before something shows up on your scans, but we, this is what we should switch you to because we can tell what your cancer is thinking before it's done it. And I think another, am I on? Yeah. An, an, another thought to that is the researchers are building the models of resistance. You had mentioned palbociclib. I'm already working on cells that have figured out palbociclib so I can be ahead of the race. So the scientists really are trying to anticipate where the tumor's going so we can add that to the blood markers. I mean, my poor little mice are getting their blood taken all the time so that I can anticipate and translate it to you ladies. Yeah, she can do that. Um, and then when she figures out what it is that we're supposed to do, I'll do it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, a lot of people are asking how do they get tested for ESR1 and they want to also understand where are we with liquid biopsies being used in the same way that testing your tumor is. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned in my talk, there is a... Um, you know, it's America, so there's a lovely competition in the market of different companies that have started making tumor profiling. And what one your doctor would feel most comfortable with or encourage you to do is probably the same, you know, laundry list of ones that any of us would think of. So I'm going to give you some names, but it's not meant to, um, it's not because of any, I don't get paid by anybody. It's just, you know, where does my brain go when I'm asked that question? So one of the, you know, the, the assays that have been around sort of the longest in this field foundation. are things like foundation medicine and um, other uh, genomic profiling groups. Garden. Garden. Um, Garden. Well, that's the, yeah, that's a liquid one. Those are ones that require that your tumor actually be biopsied. And they can go back and use a previous biopsy but I can't emphasize enough what Dr. Fuqua taught you today was that if you actually want to know about your tumor today, we need a bit of the meat from today. So while it's hard to have to go back in and do more procedures, that is the best, most useful information for the money that's going to be spent to do that test. Um, the liquid biopsies, there is a commercially available product called Guardian, and that is something that can be sent off from a blood test done in your doctor's office to that lab and you get back again a profiling of the results. And you know, for someone like me who has the privilege of working in an institution with a lot of super smart colleagues, we do tumor boards together, we talk about these molecules. Um, you know, I think for folks who are a general oncologist who have to walk out of one room seeing a pancreas cancer and walk in the next room and see one of you gals and then walk in the next room and take care of someone with lymphoma, it's putting the bar awfully high to think they're going to be able to sit down with one of those packets of information and really offer you the guidance that you might want. So there's a lot of academic institutions now that are offering molecular tumor boards where your case would be reviewed and that level of information would be talked about. Um, and maybe your doc actually does feel comfortable with that stuff. It's all a matter of just kind of where you are and where they are with understanding it all. But it is available today. And again, when to do it just kind of depends on who you are and what your cancer is currently doing. If you're on a therapy and you are doing great and you are tolerating it well and the cancer is behaving in a way that is satisfactory, table it. If something shows up, if something progresses, if the cancer outsmarts the drug that you're on, 
then depending on if you're in the territory of the next best therapy is pretty darn obvious because of the clinical trials and it's the latest and greatest thing and there's not a lot of question as to what we're gonna do no matter what those results show us, don't spend the time now, don't do the biopsy or the blood test now, wait until it's a, maybe there's a fork in the road, should we do this or should we do this? Or if it's getting it all murky, if your tumor was supposed to benefit from what you were just on and two scans later you're like, what? That's the time where it makes sense to ask the question because the cancer is obviously getting a little tricky and you need every tool in the toolbox to figure it out. And for those of you here, um, Foundation Medicine is exhibiting, so you can talk to them if you have questions about cost as well. And we know that... And I didn't know that. Yeah, no, no, I know, and that's why I'm saying it. And also, we know that depending on where you live in the country, um, protocols are different. So go ahead, Janine, if you have a... Um, so we have one person who's asking, if a treatment works for a period of time, say a year, and then it fails you, can you try it again several years later? And this particular person was asking about TDM1, but we have multiple questions about um, treatments in the ER positive setting and, and other right. types of treatments. So sort of, okay? It depends on the treatment, it depends on the scenario. So if you have a target, you always wanna be hitting the target for as long as that makes sense. So if your tumor is estrogen receptor positive, you always wanna be pressuring the estrogen receptor, depriving it of its estrogen somehow by either taking it away from the body, which is what an aromatase inhibitor does, or putting you on a drug that would block it at the level of the cell, which is something like what tamoxifen or um, Faslodex would do. And so if you're on one of those medicines and it is no longer benefiting you, the cancer has progressed, Sometimes we even continue the one that you've been on and add in one of these new companion drugs that can reverse that, um, that situation. So drugs like Affinitor, which targets mTOR, or these CDK4-6 inhibitors, or many of the other things coming down the pipeline. Sometimes you're on an aromatase inhibitor, then you've gone on to the Facilex, and it's time to switch back, and we go back to an aromatase inhibitor with one of those drugs. It just depends on what scenario is best for you. Similarly, in the HER2 space, you always want to have pressure on that HER2 pathway. It is how the cancer drives itself, and so you never want to take that break off. So, but there's different ways that you can target HER2. Now, TDM1, known as Cadsila, is quite interesting because you may not realize it is Herceptin. It is the exact molecule Herceptin, but it's linked to a very smart chemotherapy compound that gets sort of invited in Trojan horse style. Remember the Spartans? Hi, we're here, oh, come on in. And goes inside and blows up the cell. Now, if your tumor has developed resistant to that specific version of HER2 targeting, makes more sense to move on and do something else because it's actually the chemo component that's going inside the cell that the cancer is now resistant to. But you may get put back on Herceptin in combination with something. Um, you know, there's lots of ways that you can target the HER2. In the triple negative space, because we don't have at the moment standard of care targeted therapies, we don't yet know the answer to that. It could be that in time, once you're on an immunotherapy, you'll always be on an immunotherapy and we bring in different partners depending on what the cancer is doing. In general, if someone's on a chemo and the chemo has worked well for a while, but now it is no longer benefiting from them, there are so many different chemo drugs available. I know it's boring, I know it's yesterday's news, but there are like 30, 40 different chemo drugs that work. They're great, they suck, they have side effects, but you know, there are a reason why a lot of women have lived for many, many years with this disease. And so going through them in sequence as opposed to trying to combine or things that might add to side effects is more or less where we are. We probably only have time for one more question, but I'm gonna let Janine ask it. <laughs> so we'll close with a question about um, if someone has no evidence of active disease for a period, is there ever a time when they could be considered cured? <laughs> ah, the simple one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you've got it. <laughs> yeah. Does Ned mean you're cured? We all love Ned, right? Yeah. yeah. If I were going to have another boy, I'd probably name him Ned. <laughs> um, then my children probably are happy that I didn't do that. Uh, there are women who die with metastatic disease, not of it. Were they cured? They were still on therapy. 
If you have high blood pressure and you have to take a pill for the rest of your life, do you care that you're not cured? Not really. You just care that you don't die of a heart attack, you don't die of a stroke. If we can get to the point that we can turn metastatic breast cancer into something that we can contain and control, women will not die of it, they will die with it. Um, will we get to the point where we can completely eradicate it in women so that they can come off therapy and enter a cured space where they no longer need to be treated? Um, it's not impossible, but it's definitely the more rare event, and we don't always know how to figure it out. I have a gal I've taken care of who um, I gave her a break from chemo just because the side effects were so bad and she hadn't had evidence of disease on her CAT scans for a while. And I told her not to get too excited. I thought maybe six months. Oh, it's been four years. <laughs> and she wasn't on anything fancy. And I have no explanation for it. And you know, so these things do happen, but it's not the majority of the time. And I think the main thing to realize is that having metastatic breast cancer is kind of like being an ultra marathoner, only you didn't actually sign up for the sport. Um, and whether you're at mile one of your marathon or mile 15 of your marathon, you still have to run the 100 miles or so. And so um, as long as what you're on is allowing you to keep running, then it's not necessarily a bad thing to be on it. It's emotionally hard, it's expensive, it takes your time. But, um, but it is where we are right now, and so just, you know, just keep running. All right, well, thank you so much. I want to acknowledge there are so many questions and such good questions. I mean, if the two of you scrolled down these, you'd think we were talking with doctors and scientists. So I know that both of them will probably hang around if you want to talk to them. I know Dr. Borges is doing a workshop on medical marijuana, which is a really important topic. Colorado, but you know, we're getting in Pennsylvania too, even Pennsylvania. All right, I just have a few more things to say, but before anyone leaves, I need, after I finish all the travel grant recipients, I really would love you to come up here so we can take some photographs to thank our